Hello, everyone. As you're coming in, if you could let us know where you're tuning in from this evening, we'd greatly appreciate it. More people. Again, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. like we have someone from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, East Haddam, Connecticut, West Hartford, Sunny Summery, White Plains, New York, Roanoke, Virginia, Cromwell, Connecticut, Enfield, okay, we're just waiting for a few more people. Just give it a few more seconds. Okay, we'll just go ahead and get started. Hello, I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host this program for After the Miracle, The Political Crusades of Helen Keller. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit organization, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like After the Miracle, education initiatives, and other events with our community. If you, if you can, please consider donating. I'll provide a link for that in the chat. So this evening, we are welcoming Max Wallace for a discussion with Shana Gibbs about After the Miracle, which draws on groundbreaking research to reframe Helen Keller's journey after the miracle at the water pump, vividly bringing to light her rarely discussed lifelong fight for social justice across gender, class, race, and ability. Our author, Max Wallace, is a journalist, filmmaker, and human rights activist, and the New York Times bestselling author of five books. His most recent book, In the Name of Humanity, The Secret Deal to End the Holocaust, became a national bestseller in the U.S. and was shortlisted for the 2018 RBC Taylor Prize in Canada. Our moderator, Shana Gibbs is the Director of Diversity and Special Programs at the American School for the Deaf. Prior to her current role, Shana served as a university lecturer for several interpreting training programs, as a high school teacher in English language arts, and served as a program director for nonprofit and community-based advocate, uh, a uh, nonprofit and community-based community advocacy and service organization. Um, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into the Q&A section. That is at the bottom center left of the screen. Please also note that you can click on captions to see live auto captioning of this event. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase After the Miracle through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, so that is all from me. Um, please sit back and enjoy the conversation. And I'll turn this over to Max and Shana. Good evening. Hello, good evening, everyone. 
<laughs> it's really such an honor and privilege to be here tonight. I'm so excited and looking forward to this conversation. Okay, Max, after the miracle, here's your book. <laughs> So you can see all of the tabs I've added here for all of my notes. Um, and before we delve into the book discussion, I did want to open with my first question. Are you ready for it? Go for it. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. All right. So what made you want to write this book? Well, it's it's funny, you know, like like most people, I grew up with a the cliche story of Helen Keller from, re, you know, reading the story of my life in grade school. I just, I, you know, heard this, this so supposedly inspirational story of the deaf blind girl who overcame her multiple disabilities, graduated from university. That's all I knew about Helen Keller, like most people. And then I, I was working on a book about uh, Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh's Nazi affiliations and Henry Ford's. Um, poisonous seven-year crusade, anti-Semitic crusade in the 20s, uh, when he purchased a, a newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, and, and spent seven years blaming Jews for all the evils of American society. And so I'm researching the book, pouring through archives, and imagine my surprise when I find Helen Keller early on in his crusade coming out publicly and condemning this poison the anti-Semitic uh, uh, diatribes. And so it's like, oh, I've never I've never heard of Helen Keller's anything but, you know, the inspirational uh, blind girl, deaf blind girl. And then working on my last book, In the Name of Humanity, which Omar mentioned, uh, I was uh, researching the early days of the Third Reich, Hitler's rise to power. And very soon after Hitler took power, he organized a book burning, burning the degenerate works of Jewish authors and, you know, enemies of, of uh, the Third Reich. And sure enough, Helen Keller was one of just a handful of Americans who, who were targeted by, by Hitler. And so here's, here's Helen Keller coming up again. And, and you know, she, she, her book is, um, is burnt. And she composes a very eloquent, very poignant letter to Hitler himself, warning him, you know, do not, do not think that your barbarities against the Jews are unknown here. You will suffer judgment. And this is before most Americans even heard of Hitler. And, and here's Helen Keller launching what would become a seven, eight year long crusade against fascism and Nazism. And so I was intrigued. And that's what really set me off on, on this path. But there's a lot more, as I discovered. Yes, yes. And, you know, really one thing that really hit me the most was that before reading this book, I had that same a picture of Helen Keller, that little girl at the water fountain, at the water pump, you know, learning how to read and communicate. But this book really reframed Helen Keller for me in, four, in those four different parts, you know, historical timeline as well, going through that. And really just, you know, I lost myself in that work where I saw Helen Keller kind of navigate through her life as an ally and as a conspirator. Um, as a as someone who was willing to risk her reputation and her fame just because she wanted to be speak out about something that wasn't right. And so it was really impressive. And you know, just imagining that happening today and you know, our public figures, they're scared often to speak up because of what they could lose, you know? So it's that's that's the way I was framing it. You know, so with that said, you know, I think that, you know, the current world and culture and political climate and all of those things, I'm wondering what you think of Helen Keller's, what Helen Keller's response would be to it currently. 
Oh, well, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, we we might as well get political because my book's about politics, right? And and so if you were, if you want to jump ahead that far, it's interesting. Just um, just the first year of the pandemic, a uh, a disability advocate um, came out in response to a Time magazine article about Helen Keller's uh, some of her political past. Uh, revealed that she had she was once a socialist and that she was a co-founder of the ACLU. And and so uh, a disability, an African-American disability advocate came out and blasted time and said, Helen Keller is not radical at all. Just another uh, white uh, woman uh, telling the stories of privileged white people. And so <laughs> needless to say, this sets, set off a backlash. Ted Cruz immediately tweeted like that day uh how could anybody call the the great helen keller privilege this is preposterous this is an example of wokeism and then donald trump jr weighed in a couple of hours later took time off from trying to overturn the recent election and <laughs> said this is a bunch of crap so so here you have you know one of the most notoriously right-wing politicians in the united states defending Helen Keller, who was a radical socialist. But of course, Ted, Ted Cruz, like, like most people, have no idea. And, you know, it struck me that if, if what, what would Helen Keller think about being defended by a politician who stands for almost everything that she stood against in her lifetime? She, uh, she once, uh, her favorite epithet, when she, she leveled against a right wing columnist who accused her of being a communist sympathizer, she called him a dung beetle. And so I, I could just picture uh, Helen Keller calling Ted Cruz a dung beetle at the news that she'd been defended by him. So, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting. I mean, clearly a lot of what's going on in, in the United States and in the world today, there are parallels to the things that she was fighting against decades and decades ago. And, you know, it, it would be a lot safer, certainly. Right. As you as you mentioned, Shana, she took a lot of risks. I mean, the, the people around her, uh, Annie Sullivan, the American Foundation for the Blind, which, was, which became her employer for most of her life. They were consistently trying to dial down her politics and and preserve her reputation as a secular saint. And yes, it it. Every time she came out, you know, she joined the Socialist Party. She she crusaded against uh, American involvement in World War One, and in the South, where she's she's from Alabama, Jim Crow, Alabama, the most racist of all states during the post bellum era. Alabama actually entrenched the words white supremacy in their state constitution, and she comes out in 1916. She sends a check to the NAACP, the fledgling NAACP and a very poignant letter uh, decrying segregation, Jim Crow racism, and, and talking about how she was ashamed in her soul to be from the South, uh, which, which produced oppression and tears. And so, you know, this, this was not just controversial uh, in the South, her own family were gobsmacked at this. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and she must have known, she must have known the consequences. So she, she did this very publicly. So she certainly knew that the people around her and her own family were trying to preserve this image. And this was dangerous. If it, an, an Auburn University professor told me that if it had been anybody but Helen Keller, this beloved Southern icon, she could have been lynched for, for saying this. A lot of white people were lynched in the, in the South and in Alabama all the way up until the 60s. We're speaking out against segregation. Here's this socialist and feminist and, you know, coming out and talking about her shame at being from the South. This is powerful. It's hard to, it's hard to really contemplate this today, right? It, it doesn't seem very radical, some of these stands that, that she took. Uh, but at the time, they were, they were, they were dangerous. She risked a lot. Absolutely. Yes, yes. You know, as I read through the history, history, historical timeline, um, even to currently, um, you know, I couldn't help but wonder 
the kind of research you had to do to find out and discover all of that. And if Helen Keller herself was not as a poignant of a writer as she is and wrote as much as she did, would we still have been able to document what you found? And adding to that, you know, how long did it end up taking you to do that research with all of that historical information? Well, it was a great way to spend the pandemic. A lot, a lot of people didn't have as good a time during the pandemic as I did. I, you know, there was nothing else I could do. It was frustrating. I wasn't able to travel. I live in Canada. So for the first half of the pandemic, I couldn't even go to Alabama. I couldn't visit her her home and her relatives. Uh, but but the the amount of archival material that's that's still there is phenomenal and it's been digitized fortunately so you know in the old days when i was first starting out as a writer i would have to go to every archive and pour through xerox go through microfilm but fortunately a lot of this has been digitized but it's also you know there there was a long period after she joined the socialist party she she comes out publicly as a socialist in 1912 and you know before that every newspaper in america was constantly wanting inspirational declarations from Helen Keller. She wrote a lot of essays, magazines, and newspapers. Um, and, and suddenly, they didn't know what to make of this, right? All of a sudden, she's declaring war on capitalism. And, you know, they were in turn bemused and also knew that it was good copy. So she, there, there are a lot of articles just, you know, going back to the New York Times. That was her favorite paper to to, although she did declare war on the New York Times, even because they 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 called the red flag contemptible, she had a red flag in her study and considered it to be an emblem of freedom. Uh, and the New York Times, uh, you know, mocked mocked those socialists who who carried the red flag, and that prompted her to to write a, a very uh, poignant uh, essay mocking the New York Times for their hypocrisy. So she wasn't shy about uh, about speaking out against against these uh, these media that had once cel celebrated her as inspirational. Um, but but she reserved her her greatest um, ire for ableist attacks. Nothing infuriated her more than when one of these newspapers implied that that she was being manipulated by those around her because no deaf blind person could possibly have come to these conclusions on her own. So she must have been manipulated by Annie Sullivan. That was the it was always about Annie Sullivan. Ironically, Annie Sullivan was very conservative. Annie did not approve of most of these stands. She tried to dial it down. She 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 wasn't she didn't believe in suffragism, for example. Helen Keller comes out, not only is she declare herself a suffragist, but she declared herself a militant suffragette. She tells the New York Times that she's a, a suffragette for one reason, because suffragism will lead to socialism and socialism is the ideal cause. So, you know, here's Annie Sullivan who doesn't even believe that women should have the right to vote, that, that, that they had the capacity to exercise the right to vote. And these newspapers are accusing Annie Sullivan of manipulating Helen Keller. It, it's, it's almost comical. And, and, you know, he Helen Keller, one, one of the things that really captivated me and a lot of people in her lifetime was her sense of humor. She was very funny. She had this wit. She, she was famously, friend, where this event's being hosted by the Mark Twain Museum. She was famously a, a very close friend of Mark Twain. Mark Twain was very captivated by her. And, you know, there, there are all these stories about their, their banter. Their, their humorous banter and, and you know Mark Twain called her the eighth wonder of the world and there was all kinds of hyperbole but um she he knew as did most of her friends that she was very funny and she would use this sense of humor to mock ableism and to mock the media she would write these essays uh just tearing them apart and you know using a combination of sarcasm and scorn to to um belittle these ableist attacks and you know often I think just went over their heads because that, that's another thing about Helen Keller she was smarter than most people around her 
smarter than her critics, smarter than most of her friends. She, she spoke six languages. She was reading periodicals, but German. She was really, uh, she never traveled to Germany, but she was uh, during this period, but she loved everything Germanic. So she'd be reading uh, Braille periodicals or getting a friend to come in and read to her from these German newspapers and magazines. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why she was so well informed about what was happening in Germany when, when Hitler took power. She, she had been reading in German uh, original periodicals, so she knew more than most Americans about what was going on. And that was the case with, all, you know, most of her political crusades and her, her declarations about world politics. She was incredibly well informed, but the, the, the level of ableism, I mean, it's bad enough today. There's, there's still so many ableist attitudes as we know today, but in that time, the idea that somebody that's both deaf and blind could possibly come out with these incredibly well-informed uh, positions and statements and declarations, it was inconceivable to most people, except the people that actually knew her and realized how, incre what, how incredible her mind was, you know, that which... You know, I, I, we don't really have time to go go too much into detail about Annie Sullivan and the whole miracle narrative, but there, you know, I found in my research I, um, this this is one of the things that surprised me. A lot of that miracle narrative about Annie Sullivan, the, the great miracle worker that created this miracle, there's simply no truth to the narrative. It's it's very clear that. Helen Keller was a prodigy from an early age. And Annie Sullivan was definitely a very talented teacher. She, she believed in child-centered education. So you can't just dismiss Annie's role. But, but the miracle, you know, it wasn't a miracle. It was this incredible person that I discovered during my research. That, that was what made it a lot of fun, you know, just getting to know Helen Keller. And you know, I'd, I'd find myself just laughing out loud at some of her, uh, some of these essays, and the way that she would put down her critics. Uh, so you know, I, I was I was captivated by her, like, like a lot of a lot of her friends, like Mark Twain, certainly. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I was amazed at the relationship that she had with so many famous people. And, you know, I think that maybe initially I thought, you know, as an inspiration, uh, kind of inspirational porn, but then when they met her in person and really had the opportunity to be able to develop a relationship with those well-known, you know, writers, literary writers and actors and artists and political people, you know, she actually had a relationship with them on a personal level. And I found that amazing. And I think that's where they actually were able to see Helen Keller for who she truly was and respected that, you know? Uh, absolutely. You know, that there are so many, Charlie Chaplin, but, but getting back to Mark Twain, there's been a lot of stories. The Mark Twain Museum itself has had exhibits about about this famous friendship between, you know, the the, the aging author and the the uh, young deaf blind girl, and they usually highlight these these humorous Mark Twain esque anecdotes. But one one thing I discovered is that they also had a lot of uh, discussions on matters more serious, on world affairs. Helen wrote wrote numerous articles and essays about her friendship with Mark Twain. And she talked about how she, one of the reasons that, that she loved Mark Twain was that he took her seriously. He, and he had a very similar um, philo political philosophy. He hated injustice. And, you know, a lot, a lot of these uh, exhibits and articles about their friendship don't really mention that they were both uh, deeply stained by their family's connections to the evils of slavery, right? Uh, Hel Helen's, uh, Helen's family uh, enslaved a lot of people on, on, their, uh, on their plantation. Uh, Mark Twain's uncle enslaved people. He once saw uh, an African-American uh, uh, stoned to death just for the crime of doing something awkward. So it had this 
real impact on both of them, this connection to, to slavery. And it seems to have drawn them in. Clearly, Mark, Mark Twain was, uh, was captivated by her wit and by what you know what you mentioned this personal connection when you get to know her you realize what, what an amazing person she is but they he spent a lot of time nobody talks about this that uh they spent a lot of time talking about uh, injustices and war and uh, and the kind of things that mark twain is also known for you know we know that mark twain wasn't just a humorist and and did more than just write these these humorous books and essays uh but very few people know that there that Helen Keller shares that with him. So so you see this this sort of common bond. Uh, one one of the things I discovered was that uh, Helen Keller's father was the first first man in Alabama to take the obligations of the Klan. Uh, Arthur Keller. Um, that's never been revealed before. So there's this. Uh, there's this long connection to, you know, and, and the reason it's significant is I spent a lot of time in my book talking about her crusades against racism, anti-Black racism more than anything, but a lot of other types of racial discrimination as well against Indigenous people. But the, the, the decades long, uh, you know, the, the horror that she felt about anti anti-black racism and the amount the sheer amount of friends she had a lot of black friends um and it's it you know er, all the way from w.e.b du bois uh visited her when she was 14 years old still went, or maybe even younger at the uh at the perkin when she was still at the perkins school of the blind and later on she she composes her letter to the NAACP when Du Bois is the editor of their of their magazine. So that and he was also a socialist. So she spent decades uh, crusading against racism. And you know there were a lot of flaws to Helen Keller. I mean, you know, obviously I'm I'm I I, I came to deeply admire her, but there were also a lot of issues with with, with Helen. You know, she was a flawed person. And uh, you know. There's this idea that she's a secular saint, but I discovered she's very much human. You know, for she she um, she for one thing, she spends more time. Uh, she seems to get more worked up about racism, uh, about anti-black racism, than she does about discrimination against people with disabilities. That struck me. Um, I mean, it's admirable that the, this white woman from the south was so you know struck and so disgusted. And disgust is the word she used constantly when she was talking about anti-black racism. So she had black friends, and she, you know, she used her celebrity to highlight uh, racism long before it was fashionable, long before you know white liberals were speaking out against racism. She really felt this was important. But you know, disability civil rights is another issue. She had, she had quite patronizing attitudes towards. Toward, towards di her disability, it's still controversial today. And of course, she briefly embraced eugenics. This is sort of a stain. A lot of disability advocates know to this day that she once, you know, uh, what was into eugenics. It was very short lived. You know, in 1915, for a couple of months, there was a there was a case of a baby born with severe birth defects and. The doctor who was a eugenicist decided to let him die, the Bollinger baby. And Helen, uh, Helen wrote a couple of articles uh, praising him and saying the baby should have been allowed to die. Otherwise, uh, 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 a baby, anybody with, uh, with mental disabilities is bound to become a criminal. So there is this, you know, it's a little troubling when when you read this, and a little surprising considering her attitudes towards other uh, vulnerable members of society. But it was very short lived, and then, as I said, a couple of decades later, she uses her status as a disability icon to place herself on the right side of history when she starts to highlight Hitler's uh, eugenics uh, program and his uh his program to targeting people with disabilities in germany uh for murder 
before the Holocaust started. So, so you know, it, it it's it's definitely a stain on her on her legacy. But it was short lived. I think she regretted it. Um, a lot of, a lot of socialists of the time saw eugenics as a cure for uh, overpopulation and poverty. Poverty was was I, I mentioned anti black racism got her worked up. Poverty even more so. She called poverty an abomination, and she crusaded her whole life against poverty, and she blamed poverty on capitalism. So this was something that, you know, the, 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 uh, this idea of disability, people are just born with disabilities, and that's just, that was the attitude. I think a, a lot of people still believe that today, right? Disability is unavoidable. She discovers early on that a significant amount of blindness and disability in America is caused by uh, uh, industrial accidents, caused by a lack of workplace safety. So employers who didn't bother putting in basic safety uh, mechanisms in their factories and, and other workplaces. And for, for Helen Keller, this was an epiphany, almost maybe more significant than you know the, the famous uh, breakthrough when when Annie Sullivan runs her hand under the water pump and 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 she 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 says water. Um, she starts to link disability with capitalism. And then she starts to link poverty with capitalism. And she's, you know, so this is this is another um area where the media didn't know what to to think of this. Uh, the public certainly didn't know, um, and and she used it. They, people would come expecting an inspirational uh, talk by by Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan, and instead she would use it to highlight the the you know the dangers of capitalism, and and to and she offered remedies. I mean, for her socialism, it was it was, she 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 became disillusioned with socialism fairly early on. Mainly because it was too moderate. Most of the, the Socialist Party believed in uh, in realizing socialism through the ballot box, and she considered herself a revolutionary. She didn't think that she she thought voting. She said voting was a choice between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. So she thought only revolution could transform society. And then when and when the Russian Revolution happens, uh, she she's she's captivated. She calls Lenin the greatest living figure. This is something that biographers have tended to downplay. You'll see in biographies or documentaries, oh, Helen Keller was a socialist. Isn't this a novelty? We didn't know this. We thought of her as only the inspirational deaf blind girl. And look, she was a socialist. And they, they sort of portray this as a phase that she outgrew. She goes to work for the American Foundation for the Blind in 1924. And she stops talking about revolution and and the evils of capitalism and so the suggestion is that she became apolitical after that joseph lash her most celebrated biographer says she was uh she mellowed her her nephew gives an interview saying that her socialism or early socialism was a historical relic and and this is where i sort of stray from the conventional narrative i discovered through fbi files intelligence dossiers private archives that she she did sour on socialism early on, but instead of uh, becoming uh, in, instead of mellowing, she actually moved to the left. She believed in the, she believed in the great Russian miracle. She would call it a miracle. Um, you know, people called her a miracle. She's calling the Soviet Union a miracle. And you know, biographers don't want to talk about that. There's still there's not so much a stigma about socialism as there once was. Bernie Sanders and AOC are socialists, and so obviously it's still controversial. But there's also a lot of people that celebrate this, right? Maybe forty percent of America have, according to polls, have no problem with socialism. But communism is another story, right? Most people still not so not so popular, even among the left, right? So the idea that Helen Keller was a, a very strong communist sympathizer for about at least thirty three years that we know of um, is is sort of a, a, a no go land. Absolutely, absolutely.
I thought it was interesting too that um, she didn't really identify herself as a person with a disability. She never really uh, used that label, deaf blind, uh, uh, to identify herself. And she just used her platform to focus the spotlight on addressing issues for people with disabilities or uh, those political issues that you have uh, gone into, but but not for her own sake. She seemed to prioritize. Her, her priorities were sometimes uh, more societal related um, and didn't include a whole lot from the deaf community. So I found that to be interesting from my perspective. Well, that is interesting, and and it's quite conspicuous. Um, yeah, she she didn't really talk about disability. She talked about her limitations. That's the word she used. Um, and you know, we discover we discover that she she considered herself privileged. Ted Cruz, you know, was disgusted at the idea that somebody could accuse Helen Keller of being privileged. She spent a lot of her life talking about how she didn't want to complain about her disabilities because she was privileged. And, and she went to war with her own employer, the American Foundation for the Blind, repeatedly when they wanted her to push for an initiative that would help um, affluent people with disabilities or blind people with a higher income, you know, get a tax credit. She'd say, no, most blind people don't even pay income taxes. She, she cared a lot. She spent a lot of time talking about... Um, about people with disabilities, but she only seemed to care about, and I, I, it, it's unfair to say she didn't care, but she was passionate about helping people with disabilities that were also living in poverty and whose disabilities compounded their, their poverty and their, their economic uh, disempowerment, um, and especially blind and deaf racial minorities. On the, on the subject of her, her, um, her relationship with with deafness and the deaf community. She goes to work for the American Foundation for the Blind in 1924. And she spends the rest of her public life, you know, that's her, she gets a salary from them. Um, and it gave her some measure of stability. And so, yes, she was working for them as a fundraiser and, and, a, and an advocate. And she did spend most of her time advocating for the blind community. So it, it leaves this gap, she's deaf blind, and she also taught, but you know, it, 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 there weren't a lot of known deafblind people, but she did she did care deeply about um, initiatives. She spent a lot of time on initiatives for deafblind people, but there weren't a lot of deafblind people compared to deaf people or blind people in America. And so she spends, uh, you know, this is another another uh, topic I get into, but Alexander Graham Bell is her mentor. And Alexander Graham Bell, she, she dedicates the story of my life to him. He's so influential. He's the one that recommended to her father to go to the Perkins School for the Blind and try to find a teacher. So she credits him for connecting her with Annie Sullivan. But Alexander Graham Bell has a, a very a problematic legacy as well. You know, most people think of him as the inventor of the telephone. That's what he's famous for now. But he actually devoted most of his life to um, deaf education. That's why he invented the telephone. He didn't. He didn't invent the telephone as a means of universal telecommunications. He did it to prove he, his wife was deaf, especially, and and so he waged war on American Sign Language. He wasn't the only one, but he was probably the most prominent uh, of the of, of these people that um, you know virtually pushed American Sign Language for decades and decades and decades into the wilderness in favor of his preferred method, oralism, right? So he thought that uh, deaf people should learn to talk so that they could more easily integrate with hearing people. And, and he was a staunch eugenicist. I don't, I don't think his eugenicism and Helen Keller's eugenic, uh, v, v, uh, beliefs, I don't think he was responsible for that. I think it was more the socialists that she was hobnobbing with at the time, but but he believed that, um, and he wrote a very influential paper, that American Sign Language would lead to a defective variety of the race, very famously. And, you know, he was a racist, she wasn't a racist, but he was her mentor, and he would bring her. She spends her childhood as a poster child for oralism. 
both her and Annie Sullivan extolled the, the virtues of oralism. She never talked about American Sign Language. And she, you know, much to her, to her lifelong uh, regret, she tried very hard to learn to talk. She desperately wanted to learn to talk, but she never, in her opinion, she never quite succeeded. If you, if you go onto YouTube, you can, you can uh, find some examples of her, her talking. She talked in a, what she described as a guttural style. And she believed she knew, she talked about her disappointment that she was never able to speak normally. Uh, the people close to her could make out her words, but audiences, her companions would usually have to translate uh, what she was saying to the audience. But um, but so so then she goes to work for the AFB in 1924, spends the rest of her life crusading for the blind community. And, and so where's the deaf community in this? It's conspicuous. So I found, uh, I was thrilled actually, because I, I started to wonder, you know, why I know you're, you know, they're paying your salary, the, the AFB, but why aren't you advocating for the deaf community? You, you did some harm to the deaf community because you were a poster child for oralism and you helped, you know, she was a child at that time. It's not the same as the idea of being manipulated. She was a child. Alexander Graham Bell used her in her, his war against American Sign Language, but, but later on, you don't see, you don't really find her talking about uh, uh, the deaf community. So I discovered an interview, an unpublished interview with Joseph Lash, her, her uh, most famous biographer, uh, where the the director of the American Foundation for the Blind, Robert Barnett, confided to Joseph Lash. He didn't use this in his biography. Uh, he said that um, Helen approached him soon after he becomes director of the AFB in 1949 and she says Robert I have to do something about the deaf and he he told her that's not my job in other words I'm working for the blind community and I couldn't care less about the deaf community so you could tell she was frustrated she wanted to do something but she's being told no it's not really an excuse because you know she's still Helen Keller she, she can do re really whatever she wants but then one of the highlights of my book is I um, I found uh, a lot of detail about her 1951 tour of South Africa. She goes to South Africa in 1951, spends two and a half months crus crusading for both the deaf and blind communities in South Africa, the, 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 the black communities. This was her mission. Most of her, she, she toured the world repeatedly, but most of her her international tours were sort of you know more of that international uh, inspirational inspiration porn basically and she was a willing accomplice in that um you can't blame anybody but helen keller for for this but she gets to south africa and it's the first time she's got to plan the itinerary she's invited by a, a white anglican uh, priest named arthur blacksall who uh, has been working for both the blind and deaf communities in South Africa for most of his life. He's British born, but he moves to South Africa. And she gets to plan the itinerary. And I was struck by the fact that in two and a half months, there was an equal amount of visits to schools for blind people and schools for deaf people. So the very first time that she had an active role in planning her own itinerary, she made sure to include the deaf community. So it says something. I mean, I, I, was, I was impressed by that. She also, when she was in Japan and had a little more freedom, she did the same thing. She, she, she made uh, multiple visits to schools for, deaf, for the deaf community. So it, it, you can't really say that she ignored the deaf community, but it, but it is conspicuous uh, that, that she certainly spent more time advocating for blind people than deaf people. I see that some questions are coming in from the audience. How did Helen Keller's family feel about her political action? Well, they were not happy and uh, it actually plays a role in, in what I consider the most tragic episode of her life. She falls in love with her secretary, a guy named Peter Fagan who's been hired, her companion, her second companion, Polly Thompson, goes off to Scotland 
she had been taking care of a lot of the correspondence and secretarial duties. So she she leaves to Scotland, and uh, a young socialist reporter takes the job as her secretary. He learns the manual alphabet to communicate with Helen, and it turns out they fall in love. They're traveling all over the place. She's on the lecture circuit, and they they have this secret. You know, I don't know if the word affair is appropriate, but they 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 have there's something going on for a long time unbeknownst to both Annie Sullivan and her mother. So Peter Fagan is a socialist, but he's also a, um, he, he believes not all socialists do. A lot of socialists were racists at the time, but he believed in, in inequality, uh, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, certainly he was against J Jim Crow, um, but he was a northerner, so that wasn't such a big deal. But he seemed to be um, uh, worked up about racism. And so he's with her when she when she writes this famous letter to the NAACP. So when her mother and Annie Sullivan discover that they're having an affair or that they're engaged, that, that's really what Put, got the cat out of the bag. It's reported that they're about to be engaged because he goes and applies for a marriage license in, in Boston and the registrar reveals to the newspapers. Suddenly it's on the front pages of every newspaper practically in the United States that, that Helen Keller's engaged. And people were thrilled about this. People celebrated this idea that Helen Keller had fallen in love. But there were two people that were not so happy. Her mother and Annie Sullivan who both conspired to, to end this, to, to keep her away from Peter Fagan. So her mother seems to have soured on Fagan because he blames her, him, for, for Helen's uh, sudden, you know, her declaration that she's ashamed to be a Southerner. This doesn't go over well among, uh, um, among Mrs. Keller's friends and neighbors in Alabama, needless to say. And she never approved, Helen says that her mother never approved of her maverick beliefs, but it, it, that, that seems to be the tipping point, you know, this idea that he, he has pushed her, he's manipulated her into betraying her Southern heritage. Annie Sullivan, meanwhile, is equally or more upset about this marriage and conspires with the mother to, to thwart it. And most of the newspaper coverage about the about the uh, their affair about their engagement blames Annie. So contemporary accounts show that Annie Sullivan did more than anybody else to come between Helen and Peter Fagan. So there's various theories. I, I think it's pretty obvious. Like it was a threat to you know uh, Helen. Helen obviously when she was a six year old girl she relied very heavily on Annie Sullivan. She was Annie was very important in you know in helping her become. Uh, who she was. But, you know, now she's uh, 36 years old and she doesn't really, they're, they're friends more than, you know, it's not a teacher-pupil relationship anymore. And what would Hel what would Annie have done if, if Helen had gone off with Peter Fagan? He knew the manual off, but they could have gone on the lecture tour. She was now expendable. Or th that, that seems to be how she perceived it because she did everything in her power and unfortunately she succeeded. And and uh, Helen, they, they were they were going to elope. Helen, there's this very poignant and very tragic story where Helen's on the porch. Peter Fagan had been communicating to her in code through a bra the Braille typewriter, and they, had, you know, he said, "Be outside with your bags packed in the middle of the night, and I'll pick you up." The first time he came, her her brother-in-law chases him off with a shotgun. But the second time, she's waiting with her bags packed, and he never shows up. And I guess he just realized that it, it wasn't destined to be. And and so that was that was the only, one and only time that we know of that uh, that that Helen was in love. So, um, and you know, later she rationalizes it, and she she defends Annie, and she defends her mother, and says, you know, the, she she shouldn't have done this. But it's 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 really tragic. And, and it doesn't shine a, a, a very good light on Annie Sullivan either. Right. And then I see we have another question. 
I'd like to know uh, when people have read your book, will they think it's shocking compared to the elementary stories? Um, when we look at what has happened in real life? Well, um, you know, I, I think people will certainly be surprised um, <laughs> at some of these revelations. Um, my, my intention wasn't to shock people. My intention was to, you know, uh, show readers the, the Helen Keller that I was captivated by. I want people to, to know about, about that side. You know, obviously, she's more than just that that cliche of the six year old girl at the water pump. But I think when people come to know, I I end the book actually with an anecdote. I said, you know, there's a lot of progressive disability advocates today. Some some incredibly passionate uh, advocates that have sort of taken up the mantle that that Helen once had, right? So her her legacy is intact. But I I want people to to you know, maybe one day look at Helen as as this uh, as this feisty um, but flawed woman who fought the good fight, but she also loved a dirty joke and a beer, right? That, those things surprised me. You know, Helen, Helen, an anecdote about one of her friends talking about how she she laughed at dirty jokes. She actually talked about it. one of the things she loved about about uh, Mark Twain was the the tobacco. The, the the smell of tobacco and profanity that came from his lips, right? So, so this is um this is another image of Helen Keller that people might be surprised by. And she liked to drink. I'm curious. Could you share some of the challenges? that you faced while in process of uh, writing this book? Well, the pandemic was the number one challenge, right? And, and you know, I, I certainly don't want to complain about that considering some, some of the things that a lot of other people went through. I, fe I feel like Helen Keller herself, Helen, Helen always talked about how she didn't want to complain about her disabilities or her limitations because she knew she was so much better off she was so much more privileged than other people with disabilities. So it's one of the reasons, you know, she gets criticized for not talking about it, but she didn't want to talk about it, right? So for me, the obstacles, I mean, I, I there were certainly obstacles presented by the pandemic. There were obstacles presented by some of the um some of the documentaries and and biographies that have been written about her. And this idea that even for people who who know that Helen was more than the little girl at the water pump that they, they knew she was once a socialist, but they also heard that she embraced eugenics. And so, you know, I think that's one of the biggest obstacles is talking to disability advocates, people that I think would be very impressed by a lot of these things that I discovered about her, her disability advocacy. You know, the, right today, intersectionality is this catchphrase in academia. And you know the, the, these links between race, gender, class, and ability. These were missing even in the earliest days of disability studies curriculums in the 60s and 70s. They never talked about that stuff. Helen Keller was talking about this 100 years ago. Helen Keller was very much ahead of her time, not just because of these crusades and because she was a socialist, but some of the ideas uh, that she brought to the, the, the world of, of disability advocacy especially this idea of, you know, economic empowerment and the obstacles that people with disabilities face economically. Um, and, and, you know, when I try to communicate this, people have heard, oh, but she was eugenicist or, or she ignored the deaf community, et cetera. So, you know, which brings us back to there's some very legitimate criticisms and, and, and this Time Magazine article where this disability, very progressive disability advocate says, oh, she wasn't radical at all, just another privileged white woman. Um, I think that's a perception that that is widespread out there. And I think that's that's the biggest obstacle it for me in trying to so trying to convince people that yes, she had her flaws, but look, look, there's all these incredible dimensions to to Helen and her disability advocacy that 
it is being ignored because people just don't want to hear about her anymore. Oh, it's time to, and, and it's true. Like she's, she's had the spotlight for, for a long time. It's time to, to, you know, put focus on some of these other incredible disability advocates out, out there. Habin Gurma, I've, I've become very friendly with Habin Gurma, the first deaf blind woman to be, uh, to graduate from Harvard Law. And she has done some incredible advocacy, but she also is one of those rare progressive disability advocates that, that celebrate Helen Keller. She said, well, Helen, Helen Keller, if she were alive today, would support Black Lives Matter. She talked about white privilege. So, you know, she's sort of carrying on uh, Helen Keller's legacy as a, as a, not just a, a I mean, you know, a, a disability advocate, a progressive disability advocate, but but a passionate political crusader. So, which is which is heartening. You know, there are, there are definitely some people out there that know uh, that that Helen Keller should still be celebrated. And you know, while it's time to give the spotlight to other other issues and other people, it, you know, we can't just like forget Helen Keller's place in in the realm of disability history. Mm. In other words, we don't want to, I don't want to reframe this for you, but it, it sounds like you're hoping this book will impact readers by reframing Helen Keller in a, a, some, what of a different light. Is that what you hope this book will accomplish? Well, I mean, absolutely. That that that's certainly what I'm hoping for. That and and it's already it's already starting to happen. I've I've spoken of some some symposiums and there's been some advanced um coverage um even within the disability community the braille monitor uh did a review and and praised the book and you know and by by uh acknowledging that a lot of this stuff is not known within within those communities so it it's, looks like it's starting to have an impact and and achieving what i set out to do but uh it's just early days now i think we might have just a few more minutes um perhaps we can squeeze one more question in are you planning to write or do you have any other books um, in the works right now? Not exactly, but I have some ideas that I'm kicking around. But uh, um, actually a very similar, uh, there's a story that's sort of similar to this, but to do with Marilyn Monroe, of all people, and, and her own political uh, background. Might be a little too on the nose or a little too close to this, So I'm still, but I'm still kicking it around. Fascinating story. Wow. All right. Thank you. Let me see if there are any questions that we didn't catch. I'm sorry. If, do we have, Omar, do we have a, um, one more to offer? Yeah, absolutely. We have definitely, we have enough time. In your book, do, do you talk about Helen's um, association with Sweden? Bjorganism, and I apologize, the interpreter is not familiar with that word yet. Swedenborgianism, the the religion. Yes, I I I do talk about uh, her religious. Um, I I actually spend a lot of time trying to probe where her her her, her influences are. So there's this um, uh, there's a a uh, one of her mentors a man named joseph edgar chamberlain um was a very early mentor that that influenced her when she was a little girl he she visited his bohemian enclave in massachusetts called red farm and he introduced her to socialism but i also probed into her she she 
embraces this religion that most people had had never heard of Swedenborgianism, influenced by the Swedish mi mystic named Emanuel Swedenborg. And this this was her. She was raised in mainstream Christianity, but she embraced this, you know, interesting religious uh, sect. But what I discovered is that a lot of Swedenborgians, I don't even know if that's the right word, um, were associated with uh, a movement called Christian socialism. So uh, there's been a lot written about her and Swedenborgianism and her, her religious uh, beliefs. But I, I think my book's the first one to link her religious beliefs and her Swedenborgian beliefs to her socialist principles. She she started to describe Jesus Christ as him that stood with the oppressed and the defrauded. And she called socialism the new religion of humanity. Um, so, so that's sort of an interesting uh, uh, connection. Um, cer certainly, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a mystery what turned this, uh, what turned this, you know, just inspirational deaf blind girl into a revolutionary figure, you know, seemingly overnight. Obviously, it wasn't overnight. There, there, there was definitely an evolution in her beliefs. Here is another. Someone wonders if there is anyone who is interested in making your book ex uh, into a movie. Would you would you be interested in discussing movie rights? Absolutely. I mean, you know that one of the obstacles, of course, in in making a movie about uh, about Helen Keller is not only was she deaf blind, but in real life, her you know when she talked it wasn't easy to understand. So it would be a tricky, um, it, certainly not impossible. In fact, it should, you know, too many of these, of these uh, movies about people with disabilities don't use people with disabilities. There's a biopic coming, a biopic about Helen Keller at Radcliffe. So going, you know, slightly after the events of the miracle worker, but before she became a revolutionary figure and they're not using a deaf blind actor, which is controversial. And so, you know, if, if I, I, I would certainly want to, to have that, that, that um, input and make sure that if somebody is playing Helen Keller, it's a deaf blind uh, actor. But uh, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to, uh, to have this turned into a movie and to, to gain a wider audience for some of my uh, findings. So, yeah, feel free to contact me. I'd love to talk about it. It seems that we have run out of time. I'm not sure. Omar, let me know. Yes, unfortunately, we have. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much, Max and Shana. Um, it's been a great discussion. I'm so looking forward to reading this book. Um, and I don't get I, I don't often get a chance to read all the books that we have programs for. Um, but sometimes there's there's a topic that particularly interests me and and this is one such example. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so um, and thanks again to our audience for joining us. Um, Thanks to the interpreters as well. Um, please join us for future programs. Um, we're gonna have on May 2nd, we'll have a virtual program with the authors of These Are the Plunderers, How Private Equity Runs and Wrecks America. On May 16th, we'll have a hybrid program with the author of The Rediscovery of America, Native Peoples and the Unmaking of US History. Um, and also, uh, please join us for a tour at the museum. We're open six days a week. Um, actually, we might have gone back to seven, um, but we're open from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, and you can see our brand new exhibit as well. Um, it's called For Business or Pleasure, Twain Summer Sojourns, which focuses on the Clemens family's American summer vacations between 1870 and 1910. Um, 
Yes, and, and that is all for this evening. Thanks for joining us. Have Thanks, a great everybody. Evening. Thanks, Omar and Shana and, uh, and Amy and Amy, the interpreters. Thank you. I had a great time. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity.